we realize we made a terrible mistake. <music>
we have to pick a starting point. But sure. <laughs> by the end of this, I will actually give you a fundamental thesis on GameStop that I had heard just yesterday. I don't think it's out there actually, but there okay. there apparently was a there there is a an actual fundamental thesis there. But let's start with high level questions. You touched on something that I've been harping about this week as I've kind of prostituted myself in the media, and that is um, the lack of fundamental decision making or fundamental analysis going into decision making um, in in the equity market. I know this can't be quantified, but can you give a can you give a flavor for I mean what do you think the amount of fundamentals based trading or decision making that goes into trading is today versus you know some point in time say five years ago ten years ago when you first started your career you know describe what you think the trajectory of that has been well so actually J P Morgan has calculated this for us um, and their their conclusion is that if we go pre G F C it was ninety percent fundamental and. Today, it's 90% tied to ETF creation, index arbitrage, mutual fund, liquidity fulfillment, etc. There's roughly 10% or less of the actual trading activity is occurring on a fundamental basis now. I mean, has this been a linear um, decline or was there, a, was there a tipping point at which it became much more convex? So there was a tipping point at which it began to accelerate. And in particular, I would point to things like the Volcker rule, et cetera, as having meaningfully impacted dealer's ability to hold inventory or to engage in this type of trading activity. I would also suggest that um, around 2006, there was a fundamental restructuring of the way retirement uh, assets are held in the United States that accelerated the growth of passive vehicles in an extraordinary fashion. So I think those two components would be what I would point to as the inflection points that have driven us to this situation. And the problem is, is I don't see it getting better, I see it getting worse, right? Because the dynamics of what transpires with a GameStop, et cetera, that removes an active player, right? It creates the perception that there is much more risk in somebody who is trying to balance out market exposures and run a long short portfolio than in a fund that is running market exposures. It, it's creating a feedback loop where there are, there's just increased evidence, and I, I wanna put air quotes around the evidence, right? Because I think it's misinterpreted, but there's increased evidence that active management just doesn't work. And I think that is exacerbating the condition. If this is just basically, if the, the growth of passive, which continues to grow, is just squeezing stocks higher, if I want to own stocks, isn't this a good thing? It sure feels like it, doesn't it? I mean, just buy and hold and everything will be fine. You know, we spend an awful lot of time on this. And as you know, we've constructed strategies that are built to take advantage of these changes in the market. And, you know, we're thrilled to see them happen in some ways and incredibly distressed in other ways, right? Because it is not a good thing for the functioning of the market, right? What the market is supposed to do is facilitate the allocation of capital to improve the outcomes in our overall economy, we tend to forget that. We tend to think about markets as a, as a mechanism or as a vehicle for us to save for our retirement. They have no obligation towards us for our retirement, right? So I, I just think it's important to actually distinguish between that. The second component, though, is that the distribution of outcomes is changing markedly in the markets. And so what we're seeing is this inflationary condition. And when I use inflationary, I don't mean CPI, I mean rising valuations. We're seeing these inflationary conditions where assets are being bid up. In my analysis, this is much more tied to the growth of passive vehicles than it is to the Fed printer goes burr or the dollar destruction thesis, which is part of the reason that I object so strongly to those. But it also means that the distribution of downside is changing. And so what we saw last March very similar to what we saw in February of 2018 with the Volmageddon events, the XIV events, or what we saw in December of 2018. In my view, those are indicative of what's referred to as increasingly negative skew events, right? So the market just crashes with no underlying explanation, right? Or paradoxically, in the case of COVID-19, right? Levitated, 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 and then crash suddenly as people tried to reposition themselves. That fragility in the market is also rising. And so, yes, I think there's an upward bias to the markets. I think that that is giving people an extraordinary degree of confidence that they should buy the dips, which of course then reinforces that behavior. 
But unfortunately, the way I've described it elsewhere is we're driving a car with no brakes uphill. It feels fine, like there's absolutely nothing going on. And I can warn you that there's no brakes on the car. And all you have to do is just lift off the gas a little bit and you slow down. You're like, I don't see any problem. And then you go into a dip and you get a momentary panic and you realize that you're not in control of the car and then you start moving uphill again and everything's fine. At some point, we will run out of uphill. And at that point, we'll find out if I'm right that the car has no brakes. And as you come down that other side, my fear is, is that we're gonna find that we've actually destroyed the markets in the process. You know, just to push back a little bit, if memory serves correctly, um, in December of 18, the remedy was to reverse some of the rate, rate hikes then, of course, the big, you know, to me, the, the big magic trick that was performed was last year. Um, and the Fed showed that it was able to put the toothpaste back in the tube and get the credit markets flowing again and capital flowed into the equity markets. What reason do we have to believe that this will not all, that there won't always be some solution that the Fed um, can provide here? So I, I think it's always interesting, you know, when you look at it from a top down level, it feels like what happened in March is that the Fed saved the day. Right. And so, you know, the Fed cut interest rates. The Fed announced that it was going to repurchase, uh, that it would be willing to step forward and purchase credit. And that solved the problems. Right. Unfortunately, that's not what really happened. Right. Remember, the Fed actually cut interest rates on March 12th. And it was 10 days later, 11 days later, that the markets actually bottomed at much, much lower levels with a heck of a lot of chaos in between as the treasury markets themselves experienced illiquidity events associated with the Fed's actions. What ultimately in our analysis created the floor on March 23rd is the exact same thing that created the floor in December of 2018. It's the exact same thing that created the floor in March of 2018, which is a combination of purchasing power of target date funds and option expiry. All right, so when the options expire, the dealers are suddenly in a position where they have less need to chase volatility or gamma as the market pushes lower. Those conditions allow a little bit of a reset. And the second component is, is that when you look at vehicles like target date funds, there's a fantastic paper by Jonathan Parker, who's at MIT, who in my opinion has constructed the right model of what the Fed is doing. When the Fed cuts interest rates, it's not that they're stimulating economic activity. You don't rush out in the middle of the March you know, COVID events and refinance your mortgage at a lower rate. Among other things, you're simply trying to get in line to buy toilet paper at that point in time. All right, so what is actually happening is, is that collateral is being created in your portfolio. Bond prices are going up. And for a balanced vehicle like a target date fund or for a 50-50 fund, what that means is you have to mechanically start buying equities. It's not that the Fed steps in to buy equities. It's that they create the conditions where a balanced fund is now imbalanced. The reason that becomes a problem is we're now at zero rates. So is the Fed going to cut interest rates negative in the hopes of driving increased collateral and raising the price of bonds? That's, that's potentially a bridge too far, right? That changes the character of bond portfolios in a quite significant way. And it really has not worked very well in the regions around the world where it's been implemented like Japan and Europe. I understand also that part of the mechanism um, by which, or part of the reason why rate cuts will push up equities as well is that you have these investors, um, you know, especially endowments and pensions, that they can't, you know, with their inflows, they can't go and purchase bonds and generate enough of a return to meet their future obligations. And other investors, will, they have to shift more to equities in order to generate that return. You know, I mean, I, I don't think that that conceptually is controversial, but maybe the magnitude of its impact you'd, have an, you'd take issue with and perhaps the, the speed of it. But is that also a valid way of understanding where this, how this liquidity that's created by lower rates makes its way into the equity markets? I think that there is an element of impact there, although most institutions actually behave in the opposite fashion. We assume that institutional investors, and many of them are, I don't want to put to paint everyone in this framework. We assume that institutional investors are, you know, steely eyed and, and you know, have, uh, you know, nerves of steel when it comes to deploying into those types of conditions. But unfortunately, most institutions actually have a um, some form of volatility limit in their portfolio, right? So a VAR type adjustment, value at risk adjustment, which is 
influenced by the observed level of realized volatility. So actually what we saw in March is that institutions, in particular vehicles like insurance companies that run vol targeting strategies, had to sell equities into that environment. The second component in terms of whether the bonds are evaluated on their current coupon as being attractive or unattractive, what you tend to find in these conditions like March is that credit spreads widen and so on a risk adjusted basis, buying investment grade bonds is more attractive than buying equities. And so we rarely see the flows coming out of the institutional side that looks like what you're describing. In fact, what I would suggest a large portion, we wrote about this back in March, right near the lows, it was released on March 26. So it takes more than a day to, uh, uh, to write these things, as you know. We put out a report that highlighted that the dynamics of market illiquidity and the need for institutions to add back to the positions that they had sold into the March events was likely to drive us to all time highs. Um, and it ended up playing out exactly that way. The actual valuation component, so to, to define a target date fund, um, while most of, while many of the listeners may not know what they are, I would actually suggest that most of them probably are invested in one. 401k, um, the single most common vehicle for people to be invested in, in their 401k today is a target date fund. It is what is referred to as the qualified default investment alternative in virtually every 401k that's now offered in the corporate space. But a target date fund is a, a fund that based on your expected age at retirement will adjust your equity and bond allocation to match a risk adjusted or a risk targeted budget given historical volatility, given historical returns for your retirement date, right? So if you are in the Vanguard 2055 or Vanguard 2060 retirement fund, you are in a target date fund. And when equities fall relative to bonds in that type of vehicle, it creates automatic purchasing of equities that contributes to this buy the dips type framework. Let's go back a little bit and talk about the, the passive the versus active dynamic. Because you and I spoke about this a few weeks ago and you have this great analogy about a bag of marbles. Yeah. And this gets this gets to what we're talking about with respect to what floats really are and why things are so easy to to squeeze up. So the analogy that I use for people is when you when you go into a market to trade, right? Imagine you've walked into a Moroccan souk, right? You have to find somebody who's actually willing to transact with you. And so the way to model this is to imagine that you reach into a bag and you pull out a marble and there's black and white marbles in the bag. If you pull out a black marble, that represents a discretionary trader and you can actually get them to consider whether they wanna trade with you based on any number of criteria, slightly higher price, um, fundamentals have changed, the company just reported earnings, et cetera, right? So you reach in, you pull out a black marble, you have the capacity to execute a trade. If you reach in and you pull a white marble out, you don't have the capacity to trade. That's a passive player. There is no condition under which they are gonna trade with you unless they have received a signal from their end investor that says, I have given you cash or I have asked for cash. Right, those are the only reasons why a passive vehicle will trade with you. So as you increase the proportion of white marbles in the bag, as passive gains share, you raise the odds that every time you reach in to try to execute a trade, you can't do so. And so when you want to reach, you effectively have to try again, right? So if you are trying to, to buy back a short, that means you raise your bid for the, the shares that you want to buy. You put your hand back in. If you pull out a white marble, a passive marble, they're not going to trade with you. Raise it again, put it in, right? Pull it back out. Is it a white marble? As passive becomes larger and larger, your probability of drawing out a white marble rises and it creates these conditions that allow the squeeze to happen with increasing frequency and equally important, increasing severity. 